Welcome to America's Heroes Group. Welcome back to America's Heroes Group, this time with our roundtable community outreach and our partner, the American Institute of Dental Public Health, AIDPH. Today is Saturday, October 15th, 2022. October is Breast Cancer, Mental Health, and National Disability and Domestic Violence Awareness Month. You just heard our host at the break, Kof Kelly. I'm Sean Cleveland, the co-host, I'm a National Guard veteran. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith. Our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And we have a partner on the line that, and on our Zoom and YouTube. That is Dr. Annalise uh, Catherine. She is a co-founder and executive director of the American Institute of Dental Public Health. She manages the program fund development and overall strategy of the AIDPH. And we're talking about updates and information on dental care. That's something that's been on a lot of people's minds because a lot of us want dental care and don't have it. So she's going to talk about that and also give us the importance of how it affects our health. How are you doing? Hey, Sean. It's so good to see you again. Yeah. No time no see. Thanks so much for having me. So one of the things I think is important, explain to everybody, because and, and also the powers that be, we're talking about government, we're talking about the legislators and, and all the executives out there. How important is dental care to your regular everyday health? Things beyond what's going on inside your mouth. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually critical uh, to your whole body health. And, you know, I still don't get why we pretend like the mouth isn't a part of your body and, you know, therefore it doesn't impact the rest of your total health and well-being. But I think we all know just from common sense as, as everyone being a patient, everyone having a mouth and understanding that our, our dental care and our oral health is critical to to feeling good, right? I mean, we can have pain in our mouth and that is excruciating, it's uncomfortable, it leads to unnecessary visits to the ER. Um, that's also connected to opioid usage. Mm. And so we know that, yes, there's some obvious mouth and teeth issues, but we know that our mouth is also connected to chronic disease conditions throughout the entire body. Um, that's a big piece of what AIDPH has been promoting as part of our whole person health and putting the mouth back in the body, especially for veterans, is awareness around connecting oral health to chronic disease conditions. And so what we know is that veterans are disproportionately impacted by chronic disease conditions like diabetes and heart disease, and that can exacerbate uh, poor oral health and vice versa. Poor oral health can exacerbate those chronic disease conditions. So a big piece of our awareness and frankly our research has centered on understanding how veterans are experiencing their oral health um, and understanding how they're experiencing chronic disease conditions and measuring outcomes that connect the two. So to be clear for people um, and people that haven't got on Medicare yet, I'm not on Medicare yet either, but when you go to Medicare, there's no dental coverage on Medicare. You have, if, you if you want to get any kind of dental coverage, you have to get a Medicare C Advantage program, which most people don't like to get on because of the restrictions and so on with that. If you're a veteran, you can get dental care, but there's a lot of qualifications, and a lot of eligibility requirements you have to meet before you can get dental care. Can you go through some of those um, with us and kind of give us an idea about how difficult it can be to get dental care in as a veteran? Yes, actually, this is something that I found a lot of people don't understand, although veterans themselves certainly understand it. So when you look at the eligibility criteria, first of all, the eligibility criteria for VA dental coverage is set by Congress. So that's through federal code, through priority groups, and, and they determine who is eligible for what types of care through the VA. And what it works out to is about 85% of veterans don't meet the eligibility requirements to get dental care through the VA. And of that 15% who do meet that really limited, and essentially what that boils down to are veterans who have a 100% disability rating, mm -hmm. um, or a small percentage of veterans who have some sort of um, uh, mouth or oral condition that are connected to needing VA dental care, but that's very, very small. Those who qualify for that are very small. The majority of that 15% that are eligible are 100% uh, disabled veterans who have a rating, a disability rating of 100%. So of that 15% who are eligible, we know that only a third of those actually utilize the VA benefit. So we have 
kind of this really complicated issue of, one, most veterans not qualifying for VA dental care. And two, even among the veterans who do qualify for VA dental care, they're clearly still experiencing issues, but just getting in to see their VA provider for dental care. That might be because they don't have a VA dental clinic close to them. It might be because the wait times are long. It may be because they genuinely don't understand their benefits. One thing that we asked in our survey in 2021 was just a really simple question. We found we found that we there was no data available to us on oral health care for veterans. And that's largely because the VA doesn't provide dental care for veterans, you know, the 85 percent of veterans. And so the VA doesn't have that data. That's why we took it upon ourselves to research and understand how veterans were experiencing their oral health care. And so when we ask veterans just really simple questions, where are you getting your dental care? Most veterans are getting it from private practice or not getting it at all because they can't afford it. Um, And then we ask them, do you understand your benefits? Do you understand if you even have access to dental care? 42% of the more than 2,000 that we surveyed said they did not know if they had dental care through the VA. So it's really complicated. Most veterans don't qualify for dental care through the VA. And then if you do qualify for it, there's a lot of reasons why you may not be accessing it. Is government scared of changing a convoluted and archaic system? (laughs) What is, I mean, what is it, what is it with, why is, why are we still having this conversation a hundred (laughs) years later since, (laughs) since we were amputating like civil war soldiers in tents with mosquitoes and bugs and typhoid everywhere. We're we're still in this, this ancient healthcare system. And you would think that we'd have something figured out by now, you know? So what is the, what is the resistance or what is the problem while we haven't gotten this stuff straightened out yet? You know, I wish I could answer that. Quite frankly, the, the, the issues that I'm bringing up with dental care for veterans, I think we all know applies to most Americans. Like the entire dental care system is in a silo. Most people are not accessing it effectively. Most people are experiencing inequitable oral health care. You have a separate insurance system for dentistry than you have with other forms of primary care. And I think why we've taken this issue on with veterans is because we feel like veterans deserve equitable access to oral health care. Veterans have invested in their country and they deserve to get access uh, to dental care that is uh, affordable and effective and high quality. And I think to your point, you know, I've been asked the question before, is the VA even the answer, right? I, I know AIDPH has a stance on saying any expanded access to dental care is a win and that includes through the VA or, you know, any other opportunities to expand dental care. And why I think we're positioning um, the VA and and really championing for the VA to expand eligibility, it's actually back to that initial conversation where we started off by talking about how oral health care is connected to the rest of the body. So the VA is actually the largest integrated health care system in the nation. And integrated means that you're able to get all of your health care essentially in one place, or at least it's connected in the same system. So if a VA provider for, you know, your diabetes or just, you know, your family provider, your your general practitioner, they're actually able to look up your your record and see other providers that you've seen, see, you know, what other health care you've been able to get within the VA system and then inform their treatment plan by that. And so that's actually really important when we're talking about how oral health is connected to the rest of the body because the VA is the best position to give holistic care. And for some reason, you know, well, I guess for congressional reasons, the VA has not been able to expand that eligibility criteria. So while I think, yes, of course, this is a broken system, we can all do better, we can all treat veterans better, at the end of the day, I do think if we're able to expand eligibility, that the VA is actually really well positioned to give veterans um, really effective care that's holistic and comprehensive and integrated. And according to the VA's own numbers, they can do it at half the cost of what happens in the private sector. Wow. So at the end of the day, this is all um, you know taxpayer dollars. And if we're talking about cost-effective care that creates savings for taxpayers, the VA says that it is the best position to do that. Wow. I want to go over some of the things people don't maybe not know about you. So some of the things that you've done, because you've, you've been really, really busy in your career. So you're the co-founder and executive, uh, executive director of the American Institute for Dental Public Health. Um, that is, we mentioned that earlier. You're also a board member for the Texas Impact, which is an interfaith organization. You're also on the Texas Oral Health Coalition. You're an active member for the dental information informatics section of the, de- of the American Dental Education Association. 
the American Public Health Association, and a board member of Equality Texas. So with all that and your experience, how close are we to cracking this or getting at least a ball moving closer to more equitable dental care for veterans? Partic- particularly well, in light, but, and I have to add this as a caveat, when you look at other countries, they've already kind of incorporated this. This is, this is, this is not something that's, that's revolutionary or new. It's common around the world. And we have a lot of ways we could do it. When you look at the numbers, look at the math, talk to economists, I've talked to um, people, experts in the field um, with health care and, and the, the money behind it, what, what cost it would take. We could actually do it very cost effectively, like you mentioned, and it could be done many different ways. That's right. Yeah, I, I think in general, the U.S. is pretty far behind other developed countries when it comes to health care. And frankly, our our, um, our outcomes show that. Right. So we know when we compare the U.S. Uh, health outcomes to the amount of money that we spend here in the U.S., um, we are not getting a return on our investment. Right. And that applies to all of our health care systems across the board. So VA, Medicaid, Medicare, even private insurance. And that's probably for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I appreciate you highlighting the work that we do here in Texas. So I am on, you know, I run my own nonprofit and we're a national nonprofit. We're national in scope. But we also believe in state-based advocacy. And Texas is uh, the second um, highest, has the second highest number of veterans. We're almost tied with California at this point. And so it's really critical that states also be able to figure out solutions for advancing health care, dental care, and, you know, and what they can control. Because as you mentioned, these systemic issues, it's really hard for anybody to make change. I think we've actually got a lot of momentum going, which is great. I know that we, uh, AIDPH and our veteran service organization partners, which includes the BFW, which includes minority veterans, which includes uh, the American Legion, which includes disabled American veterans. I think we're doing everything that we can do to ensure that um, we're connecting the dots at the federal level to inform policymakers on where they need to go. But there's lots of opportunities on the state level. We've seen that here in Texas. You can expand Medicaid to include dental care for veterans. Um, and Oregon actually just successfully did this. I know in Iowa, they actually have a trust fund that they built out with legislative dollars that gives out grants for um, dental care for veterans when they need it. And so there are lots of different solutions that we can do right now to fill in the gap when we're waiting for federal lawmakers to really advance this equitable oral health care for veterans across the board. But here in Texas, we have a legislative session coming up uh, next year at the very beginning of 2023. And I'm really hoping that lawmakers recognize an opportunity here um, because actually by expanding dental care for veterans, again, going back to those original points about cost savings, when you're talking about giving routine access, when you're investing in prevention, in the end, it's actually saving taxpayers money. Wow. So one of the things that I noticed also, too, that you that's really, that's really important to you is the equity when it comes to particular issues with people who are transgendered, who, are, who also seek dental care. I didn't realize that was an actual issue. But there is right. issues with, and I should have, and one, one clue to this, my own story, I remember getting, I was trying to get a wisdom tooth pulled. I had a cavity I found. I went to a, this doctor was close to my house, pretty expensive doctor. And one thing I noticed when I went to his, I was sitting in his waiting room, that there was probably at least, I don't know, probably 75% of that room were transgendered or LGBTQ people waiting to get dental care. And this guy was like one of the, supposed to be one of the best guys in like Chicago. This guy was supposed to be like, you know, rock, rock star or whatever. And I was like, well, geez, well, these guys, you know, everybody's getting this, this dental care from this guy. It must be really good. But what are some of the challenges of people who are uh, transgendered trying to get dental care? And what are some of the unique things that, are, that have to be considered when you're getting dental care for people of that in that group? Oh, I'm so glad you brought this up because it's such an important topic. And we actually partner with, again, Minority Veterans of America, and they represent a huge constituency of LGBTQ plus veterans. Uh, and, and the executive director of that organization is transgender, non-binary. And what we've really done as an organization is invest in trying to understand those unique needs and experiences. And so what we do know, number one, is that Uh, queer folks in general, including LGBTQIA veterans, feel stigmatized before they even get to the dental office or to the medical office. 
Um, and that usually means that they hold off on getting care at all until it becomes an issue, right? So it may mean that because they are, are fearing discrimination, they're fearing stigma, um, it's a process of having to come out over and over again when you're talking to a medical provider or a dental provider. And so you may just avoid going to get your needs taken care of. And that usually means that they get worse. Um, so by the time that you do visit a provider and you're there in their office, um, you may be already experiencing pain. That means your costs are going to be much more expensive compared to you know, non-LGBTQ plus people who may not have that barrier of experiencing discrimination. And then what we also understand, too, especially around transgender veterans, is that, um, again, this healthcare system is is so siloed and dental insurance is so separate from other types of insurance that when you get into the office, you kind of have this whole cultural barrier. You know, is that dental office going to call you by your authentic name, going to use your authentic pronouns? Um, are you running the risk of being misgendered? Um, do people there kind of understand how to treat you um, the way that you should be treated and how everybody should be treated, which is personalized, customized care that's supporting your individual needs? And again, this isn't newfangled. Um, we believe that every person who sits in the dentist chair should be getting that um, customized patient care experience. And in fact, we also recommend that you know, every single dental care provider should be asking, have you ever served, right? That any person sitting in their chair, we know that uh, women veterans are less likely to be asked if they've ever, you know, served in the military, um, just because if there's an assumption that women are not veterans. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with queer veterans, LGBTQIA plus veterans in general. So we think that customized patient care experience can happen across the board to include LGBTQ plus veterans. Um, and so it's actually really critical that uh, folks invest in this type of care and ensuring that you're bringing a specialized patient care experience. And the last thing I'll mention, too, is that the VA is actually the largest provider of LGBTQ health care in the nation. Wow. So it's the largest provider of integrated health care, but it's also the largest provider of LGBTQ plus care. And the VA, um, I was actually just at the Minority Veterans of America Summit, which is going on today and tomorrow, and the secretary of the VA presented there and actually talked about um, transgender health care within the VA. And they're releasing all kinds of new guidelines to promote more inclusive, effective health care for LGBTQ plus veterans across the board. And so I really applaud the work that they're doing in the VA to ensure that all veterans are treated with dignity and respect. So what benefit does it? So a person comes into a, a civilian dentist's office and they say and the dentist asks if they're a veteran. How does that help the veteran? What, what? Well, number one, I think it makes you feel respected and honored and that your lived experience matters to that person. So we always say, you know, whether or not you think it's cheesy, it doesn't matter. If somebody says, yes, I am a veteran, you should always respond. Thank you for your service. I just think it's one of those ways to make your patient feel like they are respected and that they matter sitting in front of you. Um, but more importantly, for the patient care experience, I think you should also invest in what's called trauma-informed care. And this is actually best practice kind of across the board. But for veterans in particular, we should be investing in ways to make veterans feel comfortable who may have experienced trauma. And trauma can be combat-related. It could be related to your military service. Um, I know one um, example of trauma that some veterans may not realize that they even went through, but actually does impact their dental care experience today, is um, your experience of getting your wisdom teeth removed in boot camp. I, wow. I know so many that are into it. I tried, to. Yes, I I tried in... to get my wisdom. It did not work out. You did. <laughs> it did not work out at all. <laughs> I was given oh, Moltrin no. to send back to, the, <laughs> back to the barracks. It didn't work. Yes, yeah, so this is a really common patient care experience. I know it happened to my husband, who's a Purple Heart recipient. And he was in boot camp. He had his wisdom teeth yanked out. I don't think they even had like anesthetic or anything. And he had to go on like a 20 mile hike the next day. And I've heard the same thing happen over and over and over again. Um, and then to your previous guest, 
best work. Um, we know that there are um, victims of sexual assault who have been in the military. And, you know, being in a dental chair is an invasive. It can feel invasive, especially if you've experienced trauma or if you experience pain, like dental pain, that can feel invasive when someone's putting their hands in your mouth. Um, and so signaling to a provider that they should take some extra care and cultural competency and providing care. We're not talking about anything that's you know, hokey or over the top. We're talking about really simple things that people can do to make patients and veterans feel more comfortable in the chair. That includes saying, you know, asking for consent before you touch somebody like, hey, is it okay if I you know, put my hand in your mouth? Explaining very clearly what you plan on doing and why you plan on doing it. Um, you know, it's really about consent and ensuring the patient feels comfortable. Don't do things if the patient has experienced discomfort. And these are super, super simple. You would think that every, you know, provider would invest in these kind of really simple techniques, but it's actually not as commonly used as it should be. And it can really mean that a veteran who is sitting in a chair who already has some discomfort may never come back to the dentist because it could trigger something. And we believe it's really important for veterans to feel comfortable confident and um, able to feel empowered after they leave that dental visit to then take care of themselves after the visit because the majority of oral health is happening between those visits. It's not happening in the chair when you're talking to a dentist. It's that you feel good about yourself and confident enough to ensure that you're keeping your hygiene up in between dental visits. Um, And so actually that's the crux of our newest survey that we just released this week is really trying to invest in understanding that care experience that veterans have had. Um, So whether or not you've experienced trauma, um, whether or not you've experienced discrimination, uh, you know, whether or not you are getting high quality care, because what we found is when we do advocacy, um, either at state or federal levels, that we have some data now that we can work with to say, here's the cost savings, here's the disease prevalence, here's the opportunities to invest in and good policy. But what I think we're lacking still is the story. Mm -hmm. I like to tell people that all of the numbers that we have represent real veterans who have real care experiences. Mm -hmm. And we want to represent your stories and your voice. And so we do that, one, by ensuring that we're always partnered with veteran organizations. So veteran service organizations are at the table um, helping us create our research. They get copies of all of the data. And then when we sit down to talk about interventions and solutions, veterans are always there to inform that. So we take a really transparent approach to our research and ensure that the data goes right back to the veterans. Um, And so that's why we're investing in this uh, second survey in 2022. And, um, And it's really to ensure that we have all of the context that we need when we go to decision makers to say, you should be prioritizing veteran dental care, and this is why. Now, how can people access these surveys? You can access our surveys at aidph.org backslash veteran oral health. And so right at the top, you'll see our 2022 survey. Um, You'll actually see a few things on that page. Right at the top, you'll see our veteran oral health survey, and you'll be entered to win a $50 Amazon gift card if you do take that survey. And um, we hope that you do, because it's really important uh, to ensuring that we can help you and help veterans like you get the care that you deserve. The other things that you'll find on that page is how we've invested in publishing that research. So you're going to see our publications on rural veterans, on um, the economic uh, benefits of providing veteran dental care. And you're actually going to see our veteran oral health data dashboard that has information by community and state level, too. So if you're really interested in seeing what veteran dental care looks like in your state, then you're able to actually pull out those community insights. And our ultimate goal here is to democratize our data. We don't want to hold on to data. We want to ensure that we're putting insights back into the hands of veterans so that they can advocate for themselves. And also be clear, when you go and do these surveys, you don't collect personal, intimate information. It's, it's, you're basically putting in information, and it's pretty much anonymous. That's right. I'm so glad you clarified that. We don't collect any identifying information. And um, If you do choose to enter into the raffle for a gift card, you go, you go to a completely separate website. You enter your information there. It's not connected to your data. But the reason why we collect data anonymously, obviously to give you privacy and what you share, but 
Um, because we're collecting information on discrimination and things that are really important for us to understand and for decision makers to understand, we ensure that you have utmost privacy in the data that we collect. Um, and it's in its insecure places and not connected to anything identifying. So would you agree that as a nation, as a whole, that we don't really take dental care as seriously as we should? And, and then healthcare in general, more than I mean, basically for the most part, but particularly dental care, because we don't really oh, go to absolutely. the dentist until we have pain or a problem. Until, we, until that tooth is about to explode, that's when we start going to the dentist. So what are some right. things that we should be doing as, as citizens, as veterans, to in order to improve our dental care so we don't get there? Yeah, that's a great we question. So I left. think as, okay, so I think as citizens, we should be prioritizing talking to our policymakers about giving everybody um, effective health care coverage, right? So it's, it's a lot easier to go see a dentist whenever you feel like you can afford it. Um, but then outside of those dental visits, obvious things like brushing your teeth, ensuring you're using fluoridated toothpaste, um, and then ensuring that you are, are eating foods that are nutritious. Um, these are really, really easy ways to keep yourself healthy and to keep up your oral health. But I feel really, really passionate about ensuring that veterans and, and all Americans can afford their health care, can afford good nutrition. And really, that's up to policymakers in the end to ensure that that's happening across the board. Is gum bad for your teeth? Gum? Yeah. Um, you know what? If it's really sugary, it's, it's usually not good for your teeth then. <laughs> so if you do like to chew gum, I like to chew gum personally. So if you do like to chew gum, just ensure it's sugar-free. And xylitol gum actually can be helpful for your oral health. There you go. From the expert, that is some great information and also a, a, a something we want to revisit and kind of get more information about because it's so important to understand this issue. Dr. Annalise Cothran, she's a co-founder and executive director of the American Institute of Dental Public Health. She manages the program fund development and overall strategy for the AIDPH. Thanks for your time and once again, and also I'd like to have you back. Thank you. Happy to be here. This is America's Heroes Group. We'll be right back.